All right, so you can follow along as I read for us in Matthew chapter 22, starting at verse 34. But when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered themselves together. One of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Would you pray with me one more time, brothers and sisters? Father, we love you. And the reason that we love you is because you have first loved us. And we have gathered together in this building as your church to declare our love for you. God, we pray that you would be pleased this morning. As your word goes forth, would your spirit manifest himself in his presence by bringing to our hearts and to our minds truth that convicts, that persuades and convinces us of the truth of your love for us and that the only appropriate response is for us to love you back with all that we are. Father, I need your help and we need your help to have hearts that are willing to hear, eyes to see. Help us, Lord. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, um, since I wasn't with you last week in here teaching, I want to remind you of where we are in our study of Matthew's gospel. We have entered into the final week of Jesus's public ministry. It's called the Passion Week or the Holy Week, and Jesus has presented himself as the Jewish Messiah officially as he has ridden into Jerusalem on a donkey. We have seen him pronounce judgment on the nation of Israel by cleansing the temple. He was healing the hurting. He was teaching in the temple and he was being praised by the people as a prophet only to be resisted, rejected, and rebuked and questioned by the religious leaders there in Jerusalem. Jesus made it very clear through three prophetic parables that he was now rejecting those who relentlessly refused to receive him as their righteous king. And now we stand in the midst of this unrighteous retaliation as the Jewish denominations have conspired together against Jesus, who is their common enemy. They are conspiring to somehow trap him in his words. And last time we were together and we were studying this passage prior to this, we witnessed Jesus being confronted by the sect, the Jewish sect called the Sadducees, and they questioned Jesus about the topic of life after death. Death. And we looked on as Jesus rebuked an entire denomination of, of faithful God followers. He rebuked an entire denomination of Jews for their wrong theology and for their inadequate view of the one true and living God. Jesus affirmed the reality of life after death, and he gave a new revelation concerning the conditions of the new heavens and the new earth. Do you remember what it was? Jesus explained and Jesus revealed that the institution of marriage will not exist in the new heavens and the new earth. And the text tells us after Jesus responded to the testing of those Sadducees, it tells us in Matthew twenty-two thirty-three that when the crowds heard this, they were astonished at his teachings. So brothers and sisters, get the scene if you will, right? The, these religious leaders are now retaliating because Jesus has just prophetically through parables condemned them. And they respond by plotting and conspiring against them. They want to trap them. They want to make them look bad. But both attempts thus far have only caused to bring him praise by the crowds of people watching these interactions. And now we come to a third interaction in our text for today. Look with me again at Matthew 22, 34. But when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered themselves together. Take note. So, so the Sadducees, 
they didn't do it. They couldn't succeed. So, so the Pharisees now say, well, listen, we sent our students to go and trap them. They couldn't trap them. The Sadducees went, they tried to trap them. So now we got to give it another shot. We got to give it another shot. But, but I also want you to take notice. It says that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees. Brothers and sisters, the idea there is that he gagged them. He, he kept them from talking against their will, right? Because they couldn't respond to his profound wisdom. He shut them up. And when the Pharisees saw that the Sadducees couldn't get it done, they gathered themselves together, scheming, plotting, and conspiring again. All right, well, that didn't work. What are we going to do now? We got to do something. So what do they do? Look at verse 35. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him. So what they do? They said, all right, who's the smartest one among us? Who knows the, the Torah better than any of us? We're going to send our heaviest hitter to Jesus and maybe get into a debate with him so that, so that he can look bad. This is the wisdom of man, really. It's foolishness and folly. But this is what they do. Now, brothers and sisters, I want you to take note of something. How do these individuals respond to truth? They, they came to Jesus, they questioned him about life after death, and Jesus gave them the answer. They didn't like it, they didn't want to hear that, but he gave them the truth, right? And how did they respond to the truth? Not with humility, not with a loyalty to reality or what's really real, not even with shame or embarrassment. How did they respond to what's really real, to the truth? With hostility and continued Resistance. Accepting or embracing the truth was never their intention, only to achieve what their selfish hearts want. And so I ask you who have gathered together to worship the one true and living God, how do you respond to truth? Whether it be from your child who just points out your inconsistency and hypocrisy as a parent, whether it be from your peer or your coworker who, who maybe even has malicious intent, but what they said is true? How do you respond to truth? Do you reject it and continue to lie to yourself, or do you receive it? And do you embrace it, even if it's a hard pill to swallow? Because if you choose to resist and continue to reject the truth, you will look as stupid as the religious leaders did. As they continued to not accept the truth embodied in the person of Jesus Christ. This lawyer that came to them, it actually means an expert in the law. So, so this is the person who knows the law better than anyone. And he comes, and his motive, his intention is bad. It's the same intention as all those who have come before him previously. Those individuals have come seeking to trip him up, to catch him in uh, saying something wrong. So their intentions in this question is bad. But they come, and he comes, and he asks this question. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Again, addressing Jesus as a teacher, acknowledging with respect that he is a teacher. And the question is, uh, what is the great command? This, this word great here comes from the Greek word megas, from which we get the English word mega, right? And the idea behind the, the, the statement, the great command, is um, the idea is preeminence or highest esteem. Which command has the highest rank? Which regulation is the one that we, we keep as our priority over and against all of the other laws and rules and regulations that God has given us, which is the great command in the law? So when he says in the law, he's referring to the first five books of Moses. Of all the laws that God gave to us through the prophet Moses, which one has the highest priority? Which one is number one? Which one do we ask or do we keep in order, or we, which one do we keep 
at the expense of breaking even other laws in order to keep this one. Now, brothers and sisters, this question by itself isn't necessarily a bad question, right? It's, it's not a bad question. You and I, you and I do this all the time. We ask these kinds of questions all the time. Like, so, so if the government tells us to do this, but God told us to do this, what are we as Christians to do? God told us to obey the government, but we're also supposed to obey God. What happens when those two things contradict? So what do we do? We don't obey the command to obey the government in order to obey the higher command of obedience to God, right? Do you see that? That's just a genuine question. That's a, that's a very real question and, and a practical question, right? And we deal with those things ourselves. But what is actually happening is th this lawyer is bringing Jesus into a debate that is happening all the time in the Jewish culture. They were always trying to rank the laws because they were pursuing self-righteousness, right? So they're always trying to rank God's laws in order to, to make themselves righteous. And so they're engaged in this debate, and he brings Jesus into this debate. But how can... How can them asking Jesus a legitimate question, this in particular legitimate question, how can it be setting a trap for Jesus? Because it's a legitimate question. How could this be bad for Jesus? Why is that the question that he chose to ask Jesus if he wants to make Jesus look bad? You ready? First, it's an open-ended question with a lot of possible answers, right? There's 613 Jewish laws that they've counted or that they've discerned that, that God gave through Moses in the first five books of the Bible that they have to keep, that govern and, 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 and dictate their lives. <laughs> and they say, Jesus, which of these is the most important? So in them asking Jesus that open-ended question, they are hoping that Jesus would say something radical that they could actually challenge. And secondly... Not only that, but in them asking Jesus this question, they keep, they're keeping in mind that they have seen Jesus time after time present teachings that, are, uh, that contradict the popular teaching of the Pharisees. So, so they've witnessed Jesus say things and teach things and espouse things that disagree with all that they're saying, right? Right? Can you guys imagine coming to church and hearing me or Pastor Tim say, you know, this is what you guys should do. But then there's this rabbi outside who's telling you, mm, actually, you should do the exact opposite. That was Jesus. He stood in contrast to the religious leaders and to their teachings. So he was constantly going against what they were teaching and what they were doing as he was going through his public ministry. They witnessed Jesus teaching the law as one who had authority. Jesus wasn't the product of any tradition, any denomination. He, he didn't come from any known school of thought, except for that of John the Baptist. And they were under the delusion, these, these Pharisees were under the delusion that they were the gatekeepers and protectors of the laws of Moses. They falsely believed that they were the ones who were upholding the teachings of the word of God. But listen to what Jesus says about these religious leaders. In John chapter 5, he makes it very clear to them. He says in John chapter 5, Verse 44, how can you believe when you receive glory from one another and you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God? So check it out. Jesus points out and discerns the motives of the religious leaders. Why do they teach the way that they teach? Why do they teach what they teach? Their goal and their agenda is self-glorification. They want people's attention and praise and worship. That's why they teach the way they teach. And Jesus exposes it by asking that question. He goes on and he says, do not think that I will accuse you before the Father. Jesus said, listen, I, I'm not even going to accuse you before God. You know who's going to accuse you before God? Who? Who's going to accuse us who, who keep and teach the law of Moses Jesus says in verse 45, the one who accuses you is Moses in whom you have set your hope. 
So you think that you're, you're the ones who are teaching and keeping the law that was given to God's people through the prophet Moses. And Jesus says, Moses is not going to agree with you or side with you. Verse 46, for if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? So brothers and sisters, they ask this question, which is the great commandment, right? Because they're the ones who believe that they are keeping God's word. They're the ones who are, or are faithful to the word of God. And Jesus says, no, nah, you're not faithful to the word of God. But they're hoping that Jesus will say something that contradicts what Moses has already laid down right? So there's how this can be a trap for Jesus. So how does Jesus answer this question about the great commandment? He answers it perfectly, like he always does. Look at what it says in verse 37. And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. So what's the great commandment? What does Jesus say is the great commandment? He responds by quoting Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 5. Who, who wrote the book of Deuteronomy? Moses. Okay, so he's already stifled their efforts. Because in him asserting what the greatest command is, he went to what Moses wrote. So they were hoping he would say something that contradicts Moses, but... He already ended that hope and dashed that hope because he quotes from Moses. And not only that, but they were hoping that he would say something that is unpopular. But what does Jesus quote? The Shema. Every Orthodox Jew prayed this prayer. They prayed Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 and 5 every day, twice a day, because it was that important to them. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, is the equivalent of the New Testament verse, John 3, 16. <laughs> so they're hoping he would say something unpopular. And what does he quote? The most popular verse in the Jewish Bible. And dashes their hopes of trapping him. <laughs> Jesus is so wise. He's so wise and so perceptive. Now I want to look at the actual command. Look at it again, brothers and sisters. You shall love the Lord your God. Stop for just a moment. What was Jesus asked? What is the great, the highest command, rule, regulation, obligation? What is Jesus' answer? To do what? Love God. Think about how many rules, think about how many things that you do on a daily basis, brothers and sisters, that you know aren't as it ought to be. Think about how many times a day you fail. I shouldn't have talked that way. I shouldn't have said that thing. I shouldn't have interacted with that person that way. I should have done this. I've neglected to do that. Think about all the things that riddle your conscience, that, that, just, that just weigh on you about how you have failed to do and be what God has called you to be. Of all of those things, how many of us are burdened by the command that Jesus says is more important than all of those? To love God. Does that bother you? When you notice in yourself an absence of devotion to God? Does that burden you? When you can look at your spouse or you can look at the eagles or you can look at food and say, man, there is this passion in me for these things that I don't even need to coerce. But when it comes to the one who created me and who saved me, my heart is oddly absent 
of a desire and affection for this one. That should burden you. That is very telling of your spiritual condition. Brothers and sisters, the command is to love and one of the greatest mistakes of the church today in America and the secular culture that in which we exist today, one of the greatest mistakes, listen, listen to me, is that we have failed to define this word love. Did you hear that? It's the most used word and the word that is least defined, right? Because the answer is always the same whenever people come together and have a bad experience or a good experience. Man, we just got to love each other, man. We just got to love. We use this word, but we never stop to think below the surface. What does that word actually mean? We just assume, and when we assume, this is what we assume it means. Just accept everybody and everything. Just accept it. Be kind to everyone in every circumstance and every situation. And only be kind. And don't ever be anything else but accepting, but endorsing, but supporting, no matter what people say or do. We just gotta love each other, man. We just gotta love each other. And we forget, we forget that Americans stormed the beaches of Normandy with weapons of destruction, with life-taking devices in the name of love. We were not tolerant or accepting of people who had diminished the sacredness of life the sanctity of life. We said, no, this must be stopped in the name of love for humanity. We need to define love. You ready? We will not make that mistake this morning, brothers and sisters. This love that Jesus quotes from, ahev in the Hebrew, agape in the Greek, this is not the kind of love that involves friendly affections. So get that out of your mind. It's not that. The love that is presented here, the command that we are called to, this love is the kind of love that involves the commitment of devotion. Did you hear that? Commitment of devotion. Did you hear that? That is something that is, that is unfortunately absent in our culture. Commitment to anything except for self. And devotion, living that out daily. It's absent. But this is the love that God commands us to have towards him. Commitment of devotion that is directed by the will. That means you make up in your mind and in your heart to do this thing. And it is a duty. Listen to what one commentator said towards this command. Love the Lord your God. Listen to what he says. He says, the fact that love can be commanded demonstrates that it is primarily attitudes and behavior toward God, not desires. Or excuse me, not emotions. The fact that God says to do this thing means that it's not emotion. It means that it's attitudes. It's a way of thinking. And it is your behavior, your conduct that is being referred to here. See, when we think of love, we think of a dark room with flashing lights from a stage and a silhouette of a bunch of hands being raised. That's what we think of when we think of loving God. People who are in this nostalgic uh, atmosphere that are being coerced and manipulated by music. That's what we think of when we think of loving God. This is loving God. That's all we think about when we think of loving God. That is not what is being commanded here. What is being commanded here 
is that you are committed to being devoted to God. Love is a selfless, sacrificial devotion that's seeking the highest good of another. Please write that down. Please tweet that. Please make that your Facebook status. Please make a little cute thing, Mary. Please make a picture on, on Instagram that says the definition of love. Love is a selfless, sacrificial devotion seeking, pursuing the highest good of another at your own expense. It will cost you something. It requires humility. This is love. Love is not simply or solely reduced to a romantic feeling. Listen, there's a word for that in the Greek. It's eros, where we get the word erotic. That is not what is being talked about here. God doesn't want you to call him your boyfriend or girlfriend. God wants you to resolve in your mind that he is your highest allegiance and that you will forsake all else to live in obedience to what he has commanded. The love spoken of here is a commitment to pursue the highest good of another person, namely God. Well, what's the highest good of God? Well, why has God created you? For what reason? One reason only. For his glory. Amen, sister. God created you and you exist to make much of his worth. And to love him is to live a life that does that. Is your life making much of God's worth? If, you, if it is not, then you are living a wasted life and an unproductive life and a life that is counter to the purpose for which you exist. Have you heard that before? I hope that that's not new to you. But then he goes on and he tells us the manner in which we should fulfill the command. Ready? Look closer. He says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart. What, is, what does he mean by heart? He doesn't mean that organ in your chest. It's symbolic. What is it symbolic of? Listen, the heart represents the seat of the intellect, the core of a will and your intentions. Are you loving God with your intellect, with your will and your intentions? He says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul. That is your emotion, your desires, that pers the personal characteristics that make you uniquely you. Why I love peanut butter and jelly and, and Pastor Tim hates chicken, right? That's because of the soul that he has and the, the soul that I have is because that's what makes us different, our soul that God has created that is uniquely ours. With all of that, love God. And then he says, with all of your mind. And if any of you are students of God's word, you should be scratching your head now because you're like, isn't body in there somewhere? Well, why does it say mind? What is meant by the word mind is with all of your understanding. Love God with your understanding. Brothers and sisters, the text of Deuteronomy says strength, not mind. But Jesus says, mind here. In Mark's account, his parallel account of this same story and passage, mind is included, but um, isn't, or yes, in Mark's account, Jesus is recorded as saying mind and strength. So there's four aspects as Jesus spoke there, right? So your, your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength in Mark's account. But here in Matthew, we see mind included and strength or might left out. So what's the reason for this change? Why does it say mind but not strength here? You ready for the answer? I have no idea. <laughs> if anybody knows, feel free to chime in. But I will say this, although I don't know why it's quoted that way in this passage, in this particular gospel. Listen, we can set our minds and our hearts at easy in, in this. All three of these words here that are present are technically defined the same way. And they are used interchangeably in the scriptures. 
they are used. When I looked up the Greek de definition of all of those words, they all used the same definition in other words. And strength, which is absent from here, refers to the body. Listen to what one commentator said concerning this. Neither form of the text, that's the different versions in Mark's account and Matthew's account and in the actual text of Deuteronomy, uh, neither form of the text implies a compartmentalization of the human psyche. That, that means they're not actually trying to break down different parts and isolate different parts of the human being. Rather, both refer to wholehearted devotion to God with every aspect of one's being from whatever angle one chooses to consider it, emotionally, volitionally, and cognitively. So what's the point of him saying, or the text of Deuteronomy saying, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind, and with all of your strength? What's the point? Here's the point. Love God with all of your being. Love God with every fiber of your being. Love God with every faculty that exists in you. That's the point of the command. H how much should I love God? With all of me. That's how much I should love God. Should love God at every second of every minute of every hour of every day. You should love God. You should be devoted to him, not just in one area of your life, but with all of your life. It should be consecrated, set apart, sanctified unto God as your highest priority and allegiance. This is what we are called to. Some people... Um, some people try to compartmentalize or some people try to say that there's different parts of human beings um, that, that make up the entire human being. You know, people debate um, whether the, the soul and the spirit are two different aspects of a human being, and that's all fine and dandy to debate. Uh, but what's not debatable is that the Bible teaches that there is both an, um, an, a material aspect of the human being and an immaterial aspect of the human being. Uh, all parties agree on that, right, Don? They all agree that, that we, have, we have an immaterial part and a material part of who we are, and we are obligated to love God with all that we are. It is clear that we have a physical body. Ready? A physical body that exerts strength. It is clear from the Bible and from experience that we have intellect, the ability to think and to reason logically, and that we all have emotions which enable us to experience different feelings. That's what's clear. So we are called by this command to love God, to be committed and devoted to live selflessly and sacrificially towards God with our body, our intellect, and our emotions. So the question is simple for us here this morning, brothers and sisters. Are you loving God with every fiber of your being? Are you? With everything that you are, and everything that you are able to do, are you loving God? H have any of you ever read that book, The, the Five Love Languages by Gary, Gary Chapman? <laughs> My man, you're, you're ahead of the curve, bro, let me tell you. The premise of that book is this, that people receive love and understand love differently, right? So some people feel loved when they get quality time. Some people feel loved by words of affirmation. Some people feel loved by receiving gifts. Some people feel loved by physical touch, by affection, right? And there's one other one, I forget what it is, but there's five of them, right? But the concept is this. The way that you were, you were brought up and the way that you receive love is not the same as it is for someone else. So, so when, when a man goes out and works 20 hours a day and comes home and says, look what I brought you. Look what I brought you because I worked for 20 hours. And she's over there looking at what he's presented to her and says, you don't love me. And he's absolutely like, like lost. I just worked for 20 hours to bring you this and to show you and express my love for you. Yeah, because that's how you grew up. Your parents weren't there, but they just threw stuff at you and you thought that was love. But for me, I feel loved when a person actually is there. They're, they're present when they're present, and, and I have their full and undivided attention. That's called quality time. That's how I feel loved. So you can go out and work for 20 hours, and I'm going to feel unloved for 24 hours. Do you guys get the concept there? 
Know thyself and know thy partner and, and know joy, okay? But I want to share something with you. Listen, listen. You don't get to decide how to love God. God decides how he is loved. Did you hear that? Go tell it on a mountain. There are people that I engage with and interact with every day that say, oh yeah, I love God. I say my prayers every night. But you're never with God's people, never in God's word, never passionate about spreading the name of Jesus Christ. But you love God. Does God think you love him? You don't get to decide how to love God. God has already decided. 1 John chapter 5, verse 3. Write it down. 1 John chapter 5, verse 3. And this is love for God. You ready? You ready? That we obey his commands. And his commands, listen, listen, you got to get this part. You got to get this or you're going to enter into religion. And his commands are not burdensome. God has told you how he feels loved by his children. When his children obey him, when they conform to his word, when they conform to his will, when they listen to him. That's how God feels loved, right? So, so, when, so when King Saul brings a massive amount of, uh, of sacrifices to give to God, even though God told him to destroy everything, and he brings a, a bunch of sacrifices, Samuel rebukes Saul by saying, hey, is it not better to, to obey than to sacrifice? Is it not better to, to heed the voice of God than to bring God a bunch of stuff that he never needed? <laughs> Brothers and sisters, this is us. Look, I sang the songs. I sang the songs. And then we leave this place and live a life that contradicts our confession as Christians. And we think that we have loved God because our hands were raised in the silhouette. No. God decides. So here we go. Let's break it down. If this command is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind, here's my question. The heart, the intellect, brothers and sisters, are you loving God with your mind? Listen, listen. Or are you anti-intellectual? Did you hear that? God gave you a brain, and he said, devote your brain to me. <laughs> You can think, you can process information, you can reason, you use logic. Um, are you loving me with your mind or are you anti-intellectual? I can tell you this, most of the people who are going like this are anti-intellectual. Not all of them, because I do it and I don't think I'm anti-intellectual. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, do you hate thinking? or studying, or learning, or engaging in discussion, or engaging in the ability to reason? Do you hate that? Do you have zero interest in that? Then you are anti-intellectual. Do you love listening to things all day long so as to never be left with your own thoughts? Then you are anti-intellectual, and you are not worshiping God with your mind. Have you ever heard that before, brothers and sisters? Love God with your mind. How many of you are loving God with your mind? You know, people used to love God with their mind before all of the revivals. Because you know what they would say? When somebody says, when, so, when somebody had the nerve to say to another person, hey, hey, I'm a Christian, you should be one too. They used to say, well, you're a Christian, why are you a Christian? Well, Christianity is rooted in historical fact. There's evidence, there's examples, there's the testimony of scripture, there's the testimony of extra biblical literature, there's, and they would go into all of the evidences. In America, after the revivals, this is what people said. I'm a Christian, you should be one too. And they, people would say, well, how do you even know there's a God? How, how do you even know Jesus is real? Because I feel him. Because I feel him. Is that a lie? Is it a lie that they feel him? I hope not. I feel him, but that's not going to work for someone else who is intellectual. 
People give reasons based on, or give, uh, assert things all the time based on their experiences. But your experiences, uh, Muslims have experiences. Buddhists, Hindus have experiences. Atheists have experiences, right? <laughs> That's not going to work. But we live in a culture that, listen, is in their feelings. They just be all up in their feelings. It's all about how I feel. It's not about facts, right? But listen, brothers and sisters, please hear me on this. We live in a culture, in a Christian culture, that is reflecting the culture that this is the sad and unfortunate state that we are in, that the church of Jesus Christ is anti-intellectual when the greatest command is to love the Lord your God with all of your mind. Next question. Are you loving God with your emotions or are you stoic? Are you unmoved emotionally? Are you under the impression that feelings are bad and somehow make you weak? Can I tell you something? Repent. Because emotion is what will drive a man to go into a building that is burning. A feeling of obligation, a feeling of fear for another life that is in jeopardy, that emotion will move them. That emotion is what will lead a man into battle. Emotions can be used to make us strong. God is passionate about you, brothers and sisters. His spirit is moved with joy and with grief by what his children and all of creation does. And just as Jesus told the woman at the well, those who worship God must worship him in what? Spirit. Spirit, with your spirit, worship him, and in truth, which comes to the intellect, right? But I want to give you two warnings as we talk about worshiping God with our souls, with all of our souls. Here's the two warnings. We are not called to be governed by our emotions. Write that down. We are not called to be governed by our emotions. Ready? Let me oversimplify that for you. Facts over feelings. Facts over feelings. Our faith must inform our feelings. Can I give you an example of that? That, our, that, that shows that our, that our faith must inform our feelings. We must tell our feelings how to feel. Psalm 42. You can join me there. The psalmist says this. As the deer pants for the water brook, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all day long, where is your God? You ever feel like that? You ever feel like that? Like God is absent, he's far off, he's, he's, he's lost notice of you? You ever feel like that? You ever feel like that because other people are ridiculing you because of your circumstances as you obey God? You're like, that was stupid. I would have just lied. I would have just cheated. I just would have stole. You're over here talking about integrity and whatnot. You ever feel like God is not with you? These things, listen, I remember, I call to mind, and I pour out my soul within me. For I used to go along to the throng and lead them in the procession to the house of God while the voice of joy uh, and thanksgiving a multitude keeping festival man I remember the good old days I remember how it used to be I remember when it was so obvious to me that God was there I remember that and I don't feel like God is here now he doesn't stop what does he say in verse 5 why are you in despair O my soul who is the psalmist posing that question to to himself. He's preaching to himself. What is he preaching? Look at what he says. And why have you become disturbed within you? He's rebuking him. Who's rebuking him? Himself. Hope in God, for I shall yet again praise him for the help of his presence. Facts over feelings. His faith informs him. Yo, are you getting depressed? Are you getting discouraged? Boy, what's wrong with you? Get it together. God will not forsake you. God has not forsaken you. 
God will not leave you. He has not abandoned you. God is right here. He is where he has always been, on the throne, and there he will be forever. It doesn't matter how it looks. It matters how it is. And our God, in his perfect timing, will bring all things to bear as they ought to be. Facts over feelings. That's my warning to you. Do not be governed by your emotions, but allow your faith to inform your emotions and your feelings. But here's the other warning to you. Do not make the extreme opposite mistake in response to people who are overly emotional. Because people who are overly emotional are wrong. But don't make the opposite mistake and say, you know, those people are overly emotional. I'm going to be underly emotional. Don't make that mistake either, brothers and sisters, because God is not pleased with emotionless actions. He's not pleased with emotionless actions like David when the ark was being brought back from the Philistines. He danced in the streets. And they said to him, David, you're acting indecent. And David said, do you see what's happening? This is a victory for the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this. I'm going to keep dancing in the streets, and I don't care who sees me. Let that seep into your conscience, those of you who say it's inappropriate to move while we sing to our God. It's inappropriate to clap or to sway or to allow the medium which God has given us of music to escort us and to usher us and to help us in the worship of God. You cannot read the book of Psalms and walk away thinking that God can be worshiped without emotion. Be balanced. Last question. Last question. Body. Are you loving God with your physical body or are you a bad steward of your body? Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. That's the body. That's the body. Are you loving God with that? Brothers and sisters, we are called to purity with our bodies. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20 says this. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Did you hear that? This isn't the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? Did you hear that? That kind of goes against everything that American Christianity says. You are not your own. For you have been brought with a price. Therefore, glorify God, how? In your body. Be pure. Use your body according to the way in which God has designed it. Sex in the context of marriage and everything else that we know and understand to be a healthy body. A healthy body. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brother, in view of God's mercies, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship, that you present your bodies, your physical bodies, to worship to God. For I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Are you loving God with your intellect, with your emotions, and with your body? If you are not, I heard it once said, repentance is a beautiful thing. And if you are, praise God for the grace of God that has brought you obedience and conformity to loving God with all that you are. There's so much more to say, and obviously I don't have the time to say it, but I want to leave you with this one thought in light of this, brothers and sisters. I want you to think about this, that love is the highest in Christian ethics. It is what God calls us to. Jesus said, this is what God wants you to do above all else, to love. And we have talked about what true love looks like. True love is hard, but I want you to get this more than anything else, that God does not want what you have. God wants you. 
If he has you, then he will have all of your intellect, your emotion, your body, and everything that you possess. He will have you. What religion in the world compares to the truth? None. For what God wants is you. Do not disappoint him. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for this time. And I'll be the first to confess, Lord, that I have not loved you perfectly with all of my being. And I have no hope except to throw myself upon the mercy of your throne, that I might find grace and that I might be forgiven and that I might have the strength given to me from you to begin to worship you with all that I am. This is my confession, but not just mine, of all those who have gathered here to hear your word. May you give us the strength to walk in a manner that is pleasing to you. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.